the problem is that it is an instinct. The lucky thing for us, unlike my cats, is we can think through it. And that's really the part that is hard, is to understand that we are intelligent animals. And by being intelligent animals, we have to use that intelligence. Cue music. Places, everybody places. We're starting in three, two. It's time for Life Interrupted Radio, a show dedicated to practical skills for your mind, body, and soul. We're hoping we'll go in one ear and stay there. Here's the host of the show, Sharon Saylor. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio, where we look at the rise of autoimmune disorders. The NIH estimates nearly 24 million Americans have an autoimmune disorder. To put that in perspective, cancer affects about 9 million and heart disease up to 22 million. You'll be as surprised as I was to find out what autoimmune entails. I brought together top experts that range from doctors, specialists, nutritionists, researchers, and even those recovering from autoimmune to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information about autoimmunity and how to live your life uninterrupted. So let's get started. Welcome, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio. I'm your host, Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. Oh, my goodness. It's Friday night. Thank heavens. It's been one of those weeks, and it's been one of those days to get here on the show. Oh, my goodness. But luckily, it's my dear friend, Alan Eisenberg's going to be our guest tonight because it's just been a crazy time. <laughs> Made it in time, though. Thank you, Alan. Oh, and by the way, I've got my fabulous chai tea with homemade almond slash coconut milk. I love it. I love it. Oh, my gosh. I love it. The coconut milk gives it that creaminess. So I'm curled up with that tonight. I hope you guys are curled up with something wonderful as you're listening in. And as I said, I've got my dear, dear friend, Alan Eisenberg, on. He's a certified life, health, and wellness coach and the first certified coach to make his niche in coaching around bullying and abuse recovery. Now, we're going to talk tonight about all kinds of bullying, and I think it's critically important. But let me give you a little bit about Alan's background. He, and uh, his certified coaching skills makes him absolutely, his background, his, the way he, he'll share a little bit of his history as how he just can so relate because he's been through it. He's lived through it. So how we can regain our self-esteem and our health and other ways to progress our lives forward with great strategies and achieve our goals regardless of what happened. I always say on this show, regardless of our diagnosis, but tonight we're going to talk about everything from trauma to uh, adverse childhood experiences. I know that's kind of a weird, but that's the medical term, ACE they call it. And we're going to talk about bullying and all sorts of things about how that affects us. Alan is the author of two great books, his memoir, Surviving the Long-Term Effects of Bullying, called a Ladder in the Dark, and his latest book is Crossing the Line, A Cautionary Bullying Tale. That's a fictional novel focusing on the extreme damage that bullying can do to someone in their teens. And finally, Alan is also the founder of Bullying Recovery and Healthy You Coaching. Welcome, Alan. It's, I'm so thrilled to have you here tonight. Well, thank you, Sharon. Thank you for that lovely introduction. <laughs> well, well, I, I, I have, have to, to say, say yeah, yeah. it's a lot say. sometimes, you know, you listen to it and you go, oh, I'm really doing a lot right now. You know, when do I sleep? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, think, uh, exactly. I always tell people, you know, when you find your passion, then it's not work. And oh, I couldn't I agree more. That way. I never feel like anything I'm doing, whether it's working with you with the show or uh, the books that I write or the people I talk to, it's never work. You know, yeah, so. I couldn't I couldn't agree more. It's crazy to me how see as my kids like to say in your real job, mom, <laughs> <laughs> you teach communication skills, sales training skills, and nonverbal communication slash body language. And yes, and I'm as you know when I've been on your Healthy You podcast. I do geek out on that, but mm -hmm. I also geek out on the autoimmune hour. But when I was diagnosed three years ago with an autoimmune condition and I struggled, I felt sometimes I was being bullied by some of the medical profession yeah. when I would say, hmm, well, thank you, but that's not going to work for me. There was a lot of pushback. Yeah, and yeah. I, I, you know, I don't know if it was maybe falling under the technical definition of bullying, but it was sort of like... Pulling, I like that. You know, they were trying to pull me into their their frame of mind. 
So, so I think a lot of it, Sharon, what I find is the difference between sympathy and empathy. And so like with the doctors, they can't always be empathetic. You, you have to learn empathy. Empathy is not something that a person, I think, is really born with. Um, you have to experience things as with the other person. So particularly with autoimmune and difficult autoimmunes that, that I know that are out there today. In fact, I know someone who's patient zero with an autoimmune. It really, really dealt with a lot of sympathy, not empathy problems with the doctors. Empathy requires that understanding. And, and when I talk about bullying subjects or, or anything that deals with all of that, I, I don't think it's any different. I think when you can't have that empathy, when you can't experience what the other person is feeling through your own feelings of understanding, you're going to struggle. And you're gonna, what you're going to do is sympathetic reaction. So what does that mean, sympathetic reaction? I have, I have one great story from my life where I can really relate sympathy and empathy. So my wife had a best friend whose son was tragically killed at the age of nine on his bike. He was hit by a car. And actually my younger son, Zach, is named for him. So you know, we were very close with them and, and she had uh, five children. So she had four other children, a boy and three other girls. And we were very, very tight. My, my oldest was very close with them. And we go to the funeral for the, for the boy. And it's an awful funeral. I mean, you, you can't imagine, you know, I, I think those of us that have, have unfortunately had to go to uh, children's funerals know that there's just nothing you, you can say or do at that moment to anybody. You know, there was nothing I could say to our friend that was going to do anything. I could give her a hug and let her cry on my shoulder. But that was it. Right. And that's an empathetic reaction. That's, that's you know, that's my nature uh, of empathy. And as I was doing that, someone came up to her and said, well, at least you're blessed with four other children. And that's a sympathetic yeah. reaction. And that's the difference. And I was flabbergasted. I can't imagine what our friend was feeling at that moment. But that's, that's a truth. That's, that's someone who is thinking... I'm going to try to make this person feel better by saying something that is sympathetic. Like, well, at least you have other four other children to care for. Right. And not understanding the empathetic feeling of losing one. It doesn't matter. You know, it's some, it's a child she carried for nine months that she brought up for nine years that she, you know, was a part of the family. And, and I think that that has a lot to do with why, you, you have you had those reactions as well as I think we run into that all the time where people are trying to be sympathetic or maybe they're not even trying to be sympathetic. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> you know, doctors can be very cut and dry, right? You know, right. Yeah. And they well, don't have the empathy. They don't have the ability to have the empathy for you. And I think that's a frustrating part. Even when you find thinking back at one particular doctor, when I first met him, I, I thought, well, okay, he's pretty cool. He's, he, he, you know, he seems to have a pretty decent bedside manner. But as he got to, oh, I think it was his second or third visit somewhere along those lines, he started telling me how I felt. Mm -hmm. like, people with your condition, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, hmm, no, that's not how I feel at all. <laughs> you know, oh, yes, it is. No. That's not how I feel yeah. at all. And then I would explain how I felt and he would argue back. And finally I said, and this, we parted way shortly after <laughs> I said, um, okay, so do you have a chronic condition yourself? Do you have a long-term chronic condition yourself? No. Mm -hmm. Someone really close like your wife or child have a long-term chronic condition? No. Mm hmm. Mm. Then don't tell me how I feel. Well, it's, it's the, yeah, you'll you know. never understand how I feel. And right. I, I honestly put up my hand. I was one of those people before my diagnosis. You can uh, see somebody and they look, quote unquote, they look fine. You don't know yeah. that they're in, in tremendous pain and that they're just happy they're upright walking on their feet right now. You know, you don't know any of that. They look mm -hmm. just fine. Yeah. And, the other thing I've learned through chronic conditions that people that's hidden mm. is that I always say you don't you lose perspective on when an itch is just an itch. Mm. 
a certain things you'll wake up and I'm, you know, you'll wake up kind of sto- sore and stiff. And I go, oh my goodness, is that, is it coming back? Is it a quote unquote a flare? Maybe it's old age. Oh my gosh, what is it? <laughs> you know, I may have had it anyway at this age at that moment if I hadn't been diagnosed just because, you know, whatever happens as you get a little bit older, a little bit harder to get out of bed, I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't know it's you start going through this whole sort of like oh my goodness spiral and yeah. mm-hmm. I find that happens too when we've been bullied you begin to go through a spiral of I should have I could have why didn't I so let's just sort of talk about that kind of thing where we get into these spirals well and I think you hit on something that is it doesn't matter if we're talking about autoimmune or if we're talking about some sort of abuse situation or bullying situation, what ends up happening, what you're, what you're kind of describing to me is anxiety. Like you don't know and you're worried that, right? You know, so those are two indicators. So imagine you're a child that doesn't want to get up that day to go to school because they're afraid of what might happen or same thing with workplace bullying. How do you go to the workplace knowing that this is, or, or in your mind, I don't even want to say knowing, that this might happen? It, it becomes a predictive nature, right? So you start to have a pain, you go to the doctor, let's say it's in your arm, and the doctor says, oh, well, you have uh, you know, this condition um, of some sort. And next thing you know, you're having pain all the time or you get a twitch in your arm and now you think, well, is that part of the condition? And is, is this happening? Well, I think that's very much the same across the board in all sorts of areas. And, and I'll, I'll kind of tie it to myself to start and then maybe we can expand on that. But I'm what's called a highly sensitive person. And I have only recently okay. discovered that, right? Yeah. Most of us working in helping other people, we tend to be that way. They're, they're the majority, in fact, a lot of people are highly sensitive because we're built that way. We're built, you know, with an emotional sensitivity, some of us more than others. Um, but I discovered it through realizing certain things about how I, animals responded to me, how I feel about music. So just before this show, I was watching uh, some music videos. I don't know, they kind of get me in the mood. And it would, they were taking place, they were musicians who were on stage, you know, singing Free Falling after Tom Petty just died. So, you know, it, it, I, I just felt tears welling up in my eyes. And music does that to me. Movies do that to me. I actually have what I, what's called an emotional memory. I don't have a photographic memory. I have an emotional memory. I, I remember vividly details about things when my emotions were high and low and and that's really interesting you know so so a lot of the times like with music from my era the 80s let's say music I can name the artist the the album and the year it came out you know they put it on tv and I can turn my back and it's all because I'm relating to what moment I heard that in where I was and just because I'm so touched by music and and things like that so, so what's interesting about being a highly sensitive person, and as you say, you're one, and, and maybe several people in the audience are, is that your responses are also heightened. So you're constantly sort of on this edge, like, because you're, you're, you have a heightened emotional response. And for me, what that led to was being easily affected by bullying, right? So for me, I couldn't get around the fact that my... I was, I was highly sensitive. A bully would come up to me, do something, and I would cry as a little kid. And then or I would react. And that's what they were looking for, right? And, and so that was why I was bullied. That's not why, let's say, other people are bullied. But that was, that was what it was. And I, I had to go through a journey to discover that. But the problem I had, which is similar to what you were saying about your doctors, is my parents didn't believe me. So I've been telling people this story about that I, I was having suffering problems. I was having ongoing problems, including stomach problems, because there's a, a, a nerve that goes from your brain to your stomach in fight, flight, or freeze called the sympathetic nerve, and it tightens your stomach so that you're not hungry when you have to flee, right? Makes sense. 
<laughs> you except, when it's, <laughs> except when it's totally broken, like mine was. And then I just had a stomach ache. And I can't tell you how many people I talk to who are bullied, young kids, who are deal with going, can't go to school because they have stomach problems. You know, and I'm like, you don't have a stomach. You have this thing going on. You're having this reaction, right? Um, but nobody understood me. And this was before you would understand those kind of things. So a lot of people didn't talk about it. And I was one of them. And then I tried to let it go. I kept trying to let it go. Like, oh, just let it go behind you. you know, do what my parents said. Could never do it. Right. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with Alan. You can tell he's just a plethora of great information about like anxiety. And then we'll get more into the sympathetic nerve and what happens when that, I like to call it, that nerve gets stuck on. Because mm. a lot of things can happen when that nerve gets stuck on. We'll be back right in, ju in just a minute, right after this quick commercial break. Life Interrupted Radio will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. Be sure and stop by lifeinterruptedradio.com to learn more. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living. A chance to see new, hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. I am Fidel Mshombo. I was born in a city called the Bukavu in the Congo. We were a loving family. And then, boom, everything that I had disappeared in a single day. People think that when you are a refugee and they resettle you to America, and all your problems are done. They don't understand that that's the beginning of everything. I was not born a refugee. I was made one. It's time we welcome refugee families with open arms. Learn more at EmbraceRefugees.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com and your host for the show tonight and every night, uh, every Friday night, 7 p.m. And we're here with Alan Eisenberg. He's a bullying expert, on, a bullying and abuse recovery expert, as well as the founder of Bullying Recovery and Healthy You Coaching. So many other things that we'll cover some more. But we were talking about uh, the sympathetic nerve and what happens when that gets turned on. And a lot of times, people will say, um, Alan, I've heard people say, like you said, oh, it's not really happening. You don't really have a stomach ache. But it is. It's a true physical symptom when those nerves start firing and those nerves mm -hmm. get turned on. What are some things that you can tell us about learning to flip that switch so it can go off? I know you're in, uh, you've are you done a lot of work in, okay, we realize that gut tightening Maybe anxiety, the nerve is, for some reason, we're in fight or flight or freeze. And guys, it doesn't have to be that you're being bullied. Maybe you just got a diagnosis you didn't want to hear. Maybe you, you, know, you were just told you got to take a test you don't want to take. It's like, oh my gosh, that test involves needles and things. I don't want to do that. This nerve can get turned on and stuck yeah. on, yeah. even those kinds of things. Well, I think, I think a real big part of the understanding has to start at the point that we start to understand we're animals. <laughs> and this is, this is an I think that's hard to swallow, but I agree with you. We uh, have a lot, to of, a lot that. of people struggle with what I'm about to say, and I know it's tough. We're intelligent animals, so I don't want to get that wrong, but that even makes it tougher in, in a lot of cases because we think that we can think our way through certain things. The fight, flight, or freeze is an instinct. It's an instinct that all animals have. I have two cats. I never see them because theirs is on all the time. <laughs> yeah, like, they're, they're, they're flight, they're flight. They're, they're gone, they flee. Right. 
I've had them for 14 years. You know, it's like you'd think it would stop, but it doesn't. It's it's instinctual. They are first generation non-feral, so it's going to take time. That's not something that I want to say like, oh, that's just cats or dogs or, or whatever. It's people. You know, we, we all have a moment of fight, flight, or freeze, whether we watched a horror movie that scared us, whether we uh, are walking in a dark place and we get nervous, we get a tingle sensation. But everybody in the world has this instinct. And the problem is that it is an instinct. The lucky thing for us, unlike my cats, is we can think through it. And that's really the part that is hard, is to understand that we are intelligent animals. And by being intelligent animals, we have to use that intelligence. But it's not exactly easy to think that way when you're in the moment. So part of it is a, a technique that I really like when you're in the moment. The first thing you need to do is learn some basic stuff. The biggest basic help is breathing. Because that's the first oh, thing. Oh, I'm a fan of breathing. Doing. Yeah. yeah. I am a huge fan of breathing. <laughs> yeah. The first thing we do is we stop breathing. We, we like hyperventilate. You know, you hear it all the time or we hold our breath. The other thing that's really interesting that I discovered is, you know, I ask people like who, who have children, I'm like, do you remember when you would get up at two in the morning because you were afraid the baby wasn't breathing and you would go in? Where are you looking? They're looking at the belly. Babies yeah. breathe from the belly. When we turn into teenagers, for some odd reason, the studies show, our breath moves up to our chest. And what's the problem there? We have, a, we have a breastbone that's now not giving us a full breath. So believe it or not, because of that, it actually causes, it's a causation of further stress and anxiety and inability to work yourself through a situation like a fight, flight, or freeze situation. So that, I thought that's really fascinating that we have to practice, you know, if you do any meditation, if you do any quality meditation, the first thing they're going to do is help you learn to breathe. But by doing it, they force you to put your hand on your stomach and feel it. Yeah, <laughs> like, absolutely. The first, the first time I did that, I was like, whoa, that's weird. You actually get lightheaded. You actually get this huge amount of oxygen in your body and you get lightheaded. It's unfamiliar to us as adults to breathe like that, first of all. Who wants to walk around breathing looking like they're pregnant? You know, I look like I'm eight months <laughs> pregnant when I take a big belly breath. But that's where we need to breathe from. It's a diaphragmic breathing. Um, and you can even use techniques like quick breaths and then slow, quick breaths and then slow. And unbelievably, that's the first technique in all cures that I know of in order to work through these problems is to get your breath back. Have because. you ever noticed, though, with the breathing in the deep, I, I've taken breathing classes uh, and breathing yoga and other things like that. And one of the fascinating things I found, one time we were on the mat, prone mm -hmm. on the mat, and hand on the belly, the low belly, feel up and down. It's almost as the deeper the breath, you start to tap into some lost emotions. And I found mm -hmm. that fascinating all of a sudden the brain was flooded with different thoughts and some people started a tear or more like a loud cry it was it was fascinating to me that on some of these really deep breaths we were able to tap into places that obviously we'd been holding closed for a long long time yeah. and once you work through that process it was so freeing it was just an interesting right. body relaxed and that's really you know when we talk about trying to help particularly young people which I'm impassioned about, but I think anybody, we're easily distracted, we're easily ruminating. So rumination is a big thing. Like when you were talking about like the worry, well, that's, that's a rumination. Oh, you know, I have this pain. Oh, you know, maybe it's, oh, and your mind is like spinning. Well, our, our minds as, a, as humans do spin. You know, that's one, of the, <laughs> that's one of the luxuries we have as humans is we're always thinking, right? We're always, you know, doing doing something so you actually have to teach yourself how to not do that well sometimes i even just i don't have more than a few seconds i have to talk myself out of it right i have to talk myself i obviously talk myself back off the ledge well and and that's a big part of it and the other thing is are you paying true attention are you listening to what your body is telling you and so there's another very interesting part to this whole thing which is, you know, eventually, if you learn enough good mindfulness techniques and you start to work through some of these things, 
you can actually get to the point of what we call third person viewing, which is starting to ask yourself. So, so you're in battle with your mind, okay? Your mind, this great thing we have, you're actually battling because it wants to tell you something. It wants to convince you of something, you know, not that your doctors were bad or my parents were bad, but your mind's playing that with you too, right? Oh, you don't really, oh, you, this isn't really what's going on. Oh, you know, you should be really worried about this. Oh, you know, and, and it's constant. And when you're, particularly when you're at a low point, and I've been at a low point, I think many of us have, you know, they say 80% of us will at some point go through some form of depression. And that's a real statistic. Wow. This is how you, you have to start to think, right? You need to build these skills. If I had my druthers, you know, we'd be in school building these skills up. And the most interesting one I found is this third party approach, which is, let's say uh, my stomach hurts and I'm feeling anxious. Can I get myself to the point of going, looking at myself by third person and saying, hmm, that's interesting. Why is my body reacting this way? Why, why is my mind thinking this way? See, at that point, you've broken that cycle. You've broken that rumination. You're now questioning why. And that question is really powerful. You know, why? That's the answer that most bullying victims want. Why, right? Why, am, why are they picking on me? Why have I been chosen? Why do I feel this way? Why? That's the big one, right? When you can stop asking yourself why and understand, and this sounds easy, of course, and it's hard to practice, particularly a young person who hasn't quite gotten in tune with their emotions. Um, then you can start to do interesting things that we're really built to do, which is be solutions focused, which is the next step. Once you, mm -hmm. once you can understand the why, then you can build the solution. You know, I found that fascinating. And I, I always caution people, though, it's fine to ask yourself why, but be careful asking other people why. Oh, yeah. I find it's very age regressive if you look at someone and say, Alan, why? Yeah. You know, and it's like, oh, my gosh, um, why'd you do that kind of thing goes into their head or something along those lines as well. And I do find talking to myself in the third person really valuable, like, hmm, body. Wow. Yeah. You know, yeah. and talking to my body as if it as if it is not me. Mm, body, I can understand. You know, tell me what? Are, why are you feeling this way? Wow, I can understand. Mm, that must have been scary. I can understand why you might have tightened up your you know tightened up your stomach muscle body to to be able to run away fast from that that just happened. And I know people go like that's Sharon. That sounds so silly, but it, it worked. Trust us. Trust yeah. us. It yeah, works when you talk to yourself like that. Yeah, and it and it's and it's a practice. You know, the, the other part that I really think is important to emphasize is it's a practice. And I'm sure you you do this and I do this. Sometimes I can I'm I'm telling you all of this. You know, I'm I'm explaining this, and sometimes I fail at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, well, on that note, like we got to take a quick commercial break. But <laughs> I do too. You, you know, it's one of those things that I keep practicing, keep practicing, right. and. Sometimes I meet the goal and other times I don't. But we'll be right back after this quick commercial break so we don't get in trouble here. <laughs> the best of holistic, spiritual, and conscious world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free. AscendingHearts.com My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio, and we'll explore these topics and so much more on Destination Unlimited. What are all the things you witness online in a day? Cats playing piano, selfies on your feed, your friend's picture being turned into a nasty meme that's been shared 50 times, 51, 52. 
When someone's being bullied online, it's hard to know what to do. Now you can speak up with the witness emoji. It looks like an eye in a speech bubble, and it's in the symbol section near the clocks in your phone. You'll let the world know it isn't cool, and you'll let your friend know you care. Learn more at eyewitnessbullying.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio. I'm your host, Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And today we're here with the certified life, health, and wellness coach, Alan Eisenberg. His niche in coaching is bullying and abuse recovery. And you guys might be going, what's that have to do with autoimmune? But you've been hearing how the two really play into each other. And there are a lot of studies that show that people who are susceptible to autoimmune most likely had some sort of trauma early in their life or currently, you know, through PTSD or other things that trauma tends to play. It doesn't cause autoimmune. They've never found that, but they say it does tend to weaken the body and allow things to happen to us. And we've been talking about how the sympathetic nerve plays into it and all sorts of things. So Alan, we've learned to breathe, practice breathing. You can do it just really quick too. It's, I Mm -hmm. I Mm -hmm. love it. It doesn't, take more than two or three breaths to recenter yourself. If you're in a tight spot, doesn't take more than a couple breaths, just remember to breathe. And then we were talking about talking to ourselves in third person and how how delightfully well that works. And before we had to take that break, you had a third step for us, a third thing that we could do. So the other thing that's really important that we do really surrounds how to choose to take care of our bodies. And I'm sure this plays into autoimmune, but it also plays into our ability to feel better. And that's really the key is, you know, one of the things that I always say to everybody, and this is people I work with that have disabilities. You might've had a stroke. I have a good friend who had a stroke at 45, you know, at a terrible age. People who have autoimmune, I'm 49, almost 50. And I can't do what I used to do. You know, we went, I went rock climbing with my 23 year old son and he was jumping around like a monkey and I was <laughs> thought I was going to die three times probably. <laughs> and, and that, and that's just where I'm at. Right. So, so one of the things we have to realize is we're never broken. We're never dead. We're never, you know, we, we have to find the positives and we have to do things to take care of ourselves And the two most important things that we can really do that actually do have chemical changes to our body are eat right, eat the right foods, the things that feed the brain, and exercise. And you say, well, what? What do you mean? Okay, well, eating right is a serotonin release. So when you eat the right foods, your gut creates serotonin. Serotonin goes to the brain it makes you feel better. When you go exercise, most of us know this, it releases endorphins. Now, I'm not talking about you have to do vigorous exercise. You just have to exercise. You just have to do something. Uh, You can't sit in a chair. You know, what I really discovered is when when I hit my low point is when I had a job where I didn't move all day. And how many of us have that job? The, the greatest thing I ever got was something that counted my steps all day and then now alerts me, hey, you need to do some more. You need to get up from your desk. <laughs> it, like, you. it sounds so silly, but, you know, this is, we're not built. We were never built to sit and do nothing. You know, going, going back to our instincts or what we are, you know, you, you don't see animals just sitting still all day doing nothing. That's not, that's not what we do. We have to do something. And exercise will release endorphins, which we know are positive releases to the brain. So between nutrition and between exercise, you can start to work yourself out of a lot of these other things. Then with the mindfulness on as an add-on and probably also needing mentorship or possibly some, some mental health support and finding yourself around people that are supportive. Another important thing for for people, particularly in bullying and abuse victims, is to not keep hanging around people that bring you down. Mm, good point. That's a very that's a very cautious mistake that is made. And what there was just a story a few months ago about a girlfriend of of a boy, and she he wanted to kill himself, and she said, "Go for it." Do you think right. she was a good person? 
You know, do you think she had his best interest at heart? I mean, these stories are real. They happen all the time. And we, we don't separate ourselves. There's, there's actually people out there who say, you know, I want to try to make friends with my bullies. I want to try to understand and get them to like me. Well, guess what? You know what? The truth of life is 50% of the people will like you for who you are and 50% of the people won't. Right. <laughs> and some will be meaner yeah. about it than others. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's not bad. Like, I'm a highly sensitive person. So so for me, you know, I, I wrote an interesting article fairly recently talking about a couple of interesting things that happened to me because of it. But I would much rather sit around with a bunch of women, typically, have a conversation about my feelings and their feelings than I would watching a football game. Great. Not very male of me, huh? You know, so we, we built this preconceived notion of what I'm supposed to be like. And for years, I tried to be like that. And, and so the other key to your success to getting better at anything is being your authentic self. And what does that mean? Well, that's, that's a search. That's a discovery. You know, you're not going to know it as a child yet. You're probably not going to know it as a teenager, but you're going to work toward it. But as an adult, you know who you are. You get to know. And if you spend time with who you are, then you can find out who your authentic self is. But we spend an awful lot of time trying to get people who are never going to like us to like us. Yeah, and I'm glad you bring that up. There so many things there that I just want to unpack because I was thinking about uh, the people you hang out with. And I, we had a great guest on, oh, I don't know, a few months ago. And she talked about a health group coaching or group oh, yeah. circle that she went to, right? And she realized she was the healthiest person there. And she left. And I said, good for you, because the problem is, you know, <laughs> they're not as healthy as you. You don't want to, like, slide backwards. Go to a group where maybe you're the least healthy or, you know, on the lower spectrum, because you will rise up. And yeah. those other, if you're the healthiest there, they'll rise up to you. You're not going to go anywhere. <laughs> well, like you may, I won't say we won't, but the likelihood of you going further in that group is pretty yeah. limited. And then the other thing I wanted to bring up was this idea of our authentic self. And oftentimes people say, well, how do I know? And my story around that the first time I had that moment, I'd had a lot of jobs. I'm very well trained and educated and I was good at them. But I can't say I was really passionate in any of them. I guess I know a lot and I can do a lot, but I wasn't really passionate about them until one day I had the opportunity to go and I was going to be teaching and coaching these nine women and they were all professional women. And I went to this event and Alan, my first time I realized it was my authentic self. I had this moment where I looked around the room and I cannot describe it other than just to say I knew I was home. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's happened to me on the autoimmune hour too. I, when I meet people who listen to the show and, uh, you know, we bump into each other, whatever, they email me, we chat, whatever. I'm like, you know, this is another time I'm home. To me, that is that authentic self, that, that mission that we're each born for. And it's different for each of us, but to find it, I think is very freeing. And mm -hmm. oftentimes they say, I find a lot of people that I've talked to with autoimmune would describe themselves also as highly sensitive. Now, mm -hmm. there's no, I don't have any correlation or found any research that there's a correlation other than I talk to a lot of people on this show and the majority of them would label themselves as highly sensitive. So I'm always curious if there's this correlation between our emotions and how we carry them, maybe too tight or maybe too too close to the vest or whatever, and uh, keeping the, the nervous system in high activation and how it affects the physical body. Well, and I think that's a great point. And you, you brought up another really interesting point that is another cope is another way to start to recover or feel better, uh, particularly when you get in a situation where you think nobody likes me, my life is terrible, you know, all of these all of these great things I, I talk about, um, you know, there's a book called Feeling Good by David Burns. He talks about these twisted thinking styles will get in when things go south. I like Nothing that, twisted getting, thinking styles. Yeah. I love that. That's a you great know, he, it's, it's if, if you want a book that, that speaks to you when you need to hear it, it's a great book. Because it's stuff like, you know, nothing ever goes right for me. And then, you know, my job as a coach would be nothing. 
really nothing every day sucks i shouldn't have done that i should have done this these are your twisted thinking styles these are the things that we do to ourselves that aren't correct and and so you know i should be living a better life i don't understand why this is happening you're you know we we overthink all the time and then we use should shouldn'ts always can'ts won't you never know, never <laughs> no no one <laughs> and it becomes a vicious cycle and you can imagine there you know when when does a person commit bully side you know when did when or 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 as as i write about in, in crossing the line the other option is to take weapons to school right when do they make that decision you know well mm-hmm. it's when they start to talk that way when it starts to feel that way and they get no support anywhere around them that leads them to feel different and they don't know how you know people don't know how people don't know how to feel better a lot of people like griping i like griping yeah i'm one of those people what you know it depends on who you hang out with a lot of times you get rewarded for complaining you get rewarded for gossiping you get rewarded for some of the negative types of things you know people want to hear more they tell you more or they want to get down in the pit with you and maybe you have found maybe you're playing the part professional victim and you found someone who's the professional saver you know (laughs) And and and, and i talk about that quite a bit with schools and and even organizations like you have to have a culture. You have to set a culture or a culture will be set for you. Those are your two choices. You know, when, when, you, when you're in a group situation, whether it be a school, an organization, or any other kind of group that might be formed, if there's not a set of culture that is created and led and believed, then that will be made for you. And what do I mean by that, I guess? You know, some people go, what, what does that mean? Well, just like we're saying, there can be cultures where it's who made the most money or who, who is the best ball player in school. And these people get favored, you know, and I think uh, 13 Reasons Why, the recent miniseries in Jay Escher's book, talks about that, you know, that you know, the popular jock was doing all these things, but, you know, they couldn't do anything to him because he was the, the, the super jock at the school, right? Right. The one winning the trophies. Right. And so it's when you set cultures that don't speak to the other side and allow, you know, for this idea of what I call holistic recovery, because it's not just one sided. You know, when we talk about things like bullying and even abuse, you know, there's two there's two two victims. Actually, there's two people involved. There's the person who's taking the abuse and there's the person who's giving the abuse because something happened in this person who's giving the abuse uses life. So what's amazing is we've been able to put sort of the personality traits of a bully and a bully victim or a bullying survivor, as I like to say, next to each other. And there's only one variance. They both have low self-esteem. They, they have few friends. All of these things are the same. The only variance is that one can overpower the other. Mm, that's an that's interesting it. point. I hadn't thought of it that way. Right. But when they go home, Typically, they're either dealing with, with ignoring, which is a problem, or physical abuse by parents or caretakers, or verbal abuse. So they're just, they're, they're part of the victim cycle too. And even victims, even myself, right? You know, even, even someone who's so passionate about it now and who knew how bad bullying was, when given the opportunity to be on the other side and not be my authentic self, but be part of wanting to be part of the crowd because I wanted to be liked so bad, participated in bullying activities against another. And I actually made restitution with that person. I actually called them and, and you know, got their forgiveness. And we've, we've hung around a few times. Because I, again, as a highly sensitive person, I needed to get past that one for me. But it's not a one-sided story. It's not, it's not as simple. Nothing is black and white. Everything is gray. And it's very difficult for us to accept that. And so what I mean sort of in another way, another part of what you were saying is when you realize that people are less fortunate than you. So I talk about selfless selfishness and people go, what? Selfless selfishness. Yeah. Selfless selfishness is very simple. You want, if you want to feel better about yourself, volunteer to do something for people that are less fortunate than you, because you'll get two things out of it. One, you'll, you'll feel good. You'll have a, a moment of, of feeling better about yourself. But also, 
you'll be able to say, my life might be bad, but it's not that. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> goodness, Alan. We, the other we person. need to get together. Unfortunately, I got to take a quick commercial break. I'm way past the stop point here. <laughs> so uh, when we get together, we can just chat forever. But guys, hang on. We'll be right back. Connecting you with the best of the conscious minds in the world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Change and growth are part of natural life and also part of your spiritual life. Everyone needs support and guidance, especially during life passages. Upgrade yourself with the Ohm Times Experts program. With Ohm Times Experts, you have access to the best intuitive coaches, spiritual teachers, counselors, astrologists, and oracles. Our team was carefully selected so you can trust. Find out more at experts.omtimes.com. Grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and tune in for Inspired Conversations with publisher Linda Joy on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Linda creates sacred space for leading female luminaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. A soulful venue where guests openly share the fears and obstacles they've overcome, wisdom and lessons learned, and the personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired conversations to empower you on your path to authentic, soulful living. Hey, Dr. Phil here. You know, I help people solve difficult problems every day, but one problem has me stumped, childhood hunger. Nearly 16 million children in America struggle with it. Luckily, the Feeding America network of local food banks collects surplus food, giving hope to hungry children and their families. But they need your help. Join me in supporting Feeding America and your local food bank at feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour and Life Interrupted Radio. I'm your host, Sharon Saylor, and we're here with Alan Eisenberg. And since Alan and I just love to talk about this kind of thing because it's so important in our lives and in our healing. Alan, gosh, we'll have to have you back because this is just absolutely fascinating. But I want to give you enough time here when it's just about the last five minutes that we have to give us a couple parting thoughts and then absolutely where can we get your books and tell us more about how we can find out about bullying recovery and healthy you coaching. First of all, thank you for having me on the show. It's been such a pleasure. I, I, you know, I, I feel like, you know, we're friends now or old friends now. We get to do this. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the one thing I'd like to leave is that we have to stop believing that there is a solution based in one side. So, so with the bullying activist part of me, I've got to mention that, you know, if there are people in the audience that work at schools or are involved in schools or organizations, even where workplace bullying is happening, you have to take a twofold approach. There's the anti-bullying. Okay. So that's bringing someone in to talk to kids and talk to maybe the adults. And then there's holistic the holistic side, which is recovery, which is what I do. So I'm talking about the individual who is wounded. And that's what we've spent a lot of time here talking about is ways you can start to get healed, to heal. And that's critical because just because you've brought someone in and gotten one bullying incident to stop, which I doubt you did, by the way, um, or maybe changed one bully's mind, um, you haven't done anything to either one to recover them. And recovery is really so important. And even, you know, as you know, Sharon, in autoimmune, there has to be a recovery. There has to be something you're doing that's going to make you feel better. Yes. Otherwise, you're going to head down a, a dangerous spiral. And that spiral ends for many, unfortunately, way too many as attempted suicide and suicide. And in the bullying world, those numbers are 400,000 attempted, 40,000 successful. Wow. I had so, no idea. I had no idea. So we uh, can't. We, we can't have that be. Yeah, we can't have that be. So I had no idea it was that high. I mean, one yeah. one is too high, but uh, those numbers are just hard to understand, hard to fathom. I mean, we, we, yeah, we have sixty thousand children that don't go to school every day due to being afraid of being bullied. Sixty thousand. Are these the potential Einsteins of the world that aren't going to get the education they deserve? 
who knows what their potential is, but how quickly it can be lost due to, due to these factors. Oh, and it's, okay. and again, I don't want to just talk about kids. There's so many adults now, workplace bullying, familial bullying. I've talked to adults whose families bullied them. These are real things, you know, we, we need to find that empathy. We need to find ways to communicate these things and not be afraid of tags like mental health. You know, that can't be a negative tag because you know what? I've been through it and I came out the other end and I'm better for it. Mm, so, bravo, Alan. How can right. we, how can we find you? What's your URLs for both bullying recovery oh. and healthy you coaching? So it's all the same, you know, it's all through my company, which is uh, bullyingrecovery.org. You can just go to that on the web and you'll find a link to my coaching, which is uh, bullyingrecovery.org slash healthy you. Uh, you'll also find my podcast, which Sharon's been on several times. So I do a podcast and I think I might start doing a vodcast. This is kind of fun um, <laughs> where, where we talk about health issues. So I don't just focus again, you know, my, at the beginning, I focused on bullying stories. So when I started my first site, bullying stories, I had, you know, 1.4 million people visiting me and reading the stories. My stories are over. You can still read them. They're still there. But now it's recovery. Now it's how can we make ourselves better? So I'm also on Facebook at Bullying Recovery, Twitter, Bullying LTE. And then for my books, they're on Amazon and really at any major online bookstore. Um, and so uh, there's A Ladder in the Dark, which is my memoir, which is the first thing I wrote. I'm also published in a couple other people's books, an upcoming one about workplace bullying, actually. A Ladder in the Dark is my story. It's how I got to this point that I'm at today to try to help others. Uh, and the, to help others, it was really a physician heal thyself maneuver. You know, I had to, oftentimes it is even with autoimmune, yeah. it's, it's something about, you can get all the advice, yeah. but you got to take the first step. Well, I remember, you know, when I was in therapy, I looked at my therapist one day, I said, why do you do what you do? And he just looked at me and he goes, you know why? So now when people ask me, why do you do bullying recovery? I say, you know why? <laughs> so, <laughs> same answer. You know, it's, uh, we're, we're all in this together. Um, and then Crossing the Line, which came out in January, is uh, a fictional novel based a lot around factual stories. So it all takes place in a fictional town, but it looks at the extremes and the extremes being what brings someone to the brink of suicide from bullying or what brings someone to want to go into a school with weapons and use them because of bullying. Wow. And so it, it really looks and it's told from the perspective of four different youths and you get a really good feeling and understanding as to what's going on in their minds. And this is, again, is all based in reality. I didn't, I didn't, you know, while it's fiction, while I wrote it fictionally, it was based on me reading a whole lot of accounts. And so this is, you know, I, I believe it's the truth. I believe it's very close to what we have to understand. And the one thing I always say is, what's the line? The line is that thin line between choosing to take your own life or go in and take other people's lives. And the problem is, if, if a, a child, if a, a teenager takes their own life, we're, we're aghast, we're, we're, we're so upset about it, and all it was due to bullying. But that same causation could be the reason that someone went into a school because they were so scared of what might happen to them there that they go in with a weapon and they use it. And they're mm -hmm. demonized, their life is ruined. And really how close are they, those two victims, in what they do. So I hope people will read it and, and get a better understanding of, of what the causations of, of these situations are and how drastic they can be and why we as a society need to do something about it. When you were telling me about the two sides there just a moment ago, I'm thinking, and how, what a shame. Why as a culture, we even bring them to that point of them making an either or decision with such right awful consequences on both sides. Well, Alan, we're going to have to have you back, dear. You know I love you, and we can always just chat for hours, but our time is up here. Everyone, thank you for listening to the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio. Go have a great weekend, whatever your adventures. And as always, enjoy. The information provided on lifeinterruptedradio.com is for educational purposes only. What you hear, read, and see on Life Interrupted Radio is based on experience only. The information presented here should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes. 
Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on Life Interrupted Radio. You've been listening to Life Interrupted Radio. To learn more, listen to other shows, and gain free resources that can help empower your life, be sure to stop by lifeinterruptedradio.com. Do you want to be a better leader, have better relationships, become more self-aware, be a better communicator? Hi, I'm Sharon Saylor, best-selling author, professional speaker, and executive coach. And my life passion is empowering professionals to be the best that they can be. After years of working with professionals, I've discovered the seven things nobody is telling you that can cost you your clients, sales, and even your career. And I want to give it to you free. You've heard my show. You know my passion. And maybe we'll be working together sooner rather than later. So go grab this ebook now to find out the seven things that's costing you big time. Over at SharonSailor.com forward slash radio gift. Hi, this is Sharon, and of course you know me from here on the Autoimmune Hour, but recently I delved into the world of children's fiction with the Pinky Chenille series. The first book launched just a couple of weeks ago, and it's already getting awesome reviews. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. If you haven't had a chance to check out Pinky Chenille and the Rainbow Hunters, go over and check it out at PinkyChenille.com. That's Pinky. P-I-N-K-Y, Chenille, C-H-E-N-I-L-L-E dot com. 